So you're saying there is no iced tea brand in the MENA region? There are a number of international multi-billion dollar brands that are active and that sell in the region. But we are the first mainstream, natural, healthier Arabian iced tea brand. Bismillah rahman rahim Welcome to the Mosho Podcast, episode 35. My guest tonight is a former investment banker of many years. Today, he is the CEO and founder of Nye Tea, a product that truly pays homage to the heritage and love for tea that our region is certainly known for. They launched back in 2017, so I mean, only four years ago at this point. Uh, They are available across the MENA region and Canada. I, for one, consider myself very lucky and fortunate to have this gentleman in front of me tonight for the season finale. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Hisham Farooqi. Thank you so much, uh, Mo. Really, really appreciate being here. And I want to congratulate you on an incredible uh, first season of the podcast. So well done. Thanks so much, Hisham. It means a lot. By the way, I was very strategic with who I'm going to choose for my last guest. Uh, and it had to be, you know, someone with your stature. So uh, I feel the pressure. <laughs> <laughs> no, impossible. I don't think you're the kind of person that ever feels pressure. How have you been, buddy? How are things going? Uh, well, you know, you, you started this business in 2017, two years before what... Uh, we all went through recently. Uh, how difficult was it to weather the storm uh, in, uh, as far as your industry was concerned? Um, so there's this perception that you know uh, a lot of uh, consumer goods brands did quite well during uh, COVID, unfortunately, and very, for very specific reasons, which were basically the fact that we were in the midst of shifting our production from being exclusively in North America to Saudi Arabia when COVID hit. Um, it really, really did harm us quite a bit. So we, just because of supply chain issues, through pretty much most of 2020, we were out of product. Um, Now, thankfully, what's happened is um, 2021 has been a really exciting year. We've been growing extremely robustly. We've been opening up new markets. Um, So hopefully by, I'll say, beginning of Q4, we'll be in 10 territories in the region, of which six or seven we've opened up um, over the last uh, eight, nine months. Oh, fantastic. Um, your background and career path was, was uh, no, nowhere near the, uh, the FNB. Was it an interest of yours starting off uh, at all? Like after you ended college, did you ever think you'd enter the FNB space? Well, when I graduated, all I wanted to do was be uh, an investment banker on Wall Street. So, you know, we had seen all these movies and read all these books about uh, investment banking. And I was really, really excited to, to move to New York and, and give it a shot. Um, and I was very, really fortunate to uh, have spent four, four and a half years um, at JP Morgan between New York and London. My initial plan was to go get an MBA. And then, you know, long story short, um, and really don't ask how, but suddenly I found myself back in Saudi Arabia and uh, um, in the bakery business. So um, I became an entrepreneur for the first time back in 2001. Um, I, I helped found a family business, which was in the bakery pastry cafe um, segment. Uh, thankfully, back then we were, you know, first movers. We were pioneers in the industry, and thankfully we did quite well. So within three years, we had nine operating outlets. We had a big production distribution business, and um, um, we got an opportunity to sell, um, which we did in 2005. So, um, you know, although as a family we do have a background in FNB. Um, that was never my mission. That was never my vision. Um, it was just really circumstance that brought me to suddenly becoming a baker. Who would have thought? I remember the ba- bakery very well, actually. Um, I had a job in the mall that it was in, and I used to frequent it from time to time. Oh, thank you. Um, the nine locations you had, were they all in Saudi? Yes, so we were very much sort of a Jeddah-based business. Um, when we started looking at the opportunity to expand outside, we started talking to people about partnering with us in Dubai at the time was just starting to boom. The UAE, we looked at Egypt, we were looking at Riyadh, etc. Um, that's when sort of this, uh, this group came in and, and made us an offer and we thought it would be a, a good exit. So uh, we took it. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you kicked off your career after you graduated uh, and you, 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 know, you went to Wall Street, uh, as glamorous as that sounds. Um, you then moved uh, in finance, you moved to private equity. What caught your interest in uh, private equity and wanting you to move to there? Well, when I when we sold at Furun, um, 
I, I really didn't know what to do exactly. Um, so I took a year off. I got an MBA. I went to NSEAD. I spent some time at Wharton. Um, and really for the first time, it was for the first time I was studying for myself. Um, it was a really, really good period. I had just gotten married, so it was a great time sort of to, to be living abroad with my wife um, and to just be learning. So I was taking subjects that I was interested in. I was learning about entrepreneurship, even though I had done it before, but I was really learning sort of the, the, you know, the science behind it. Um, I was looking at private equity because private equity was just on the cusp of, of really starting off in the region. Mm -hmm. um, I remember attending the first private equity conference in the region uh, back in 2004, and there were like 25 people in the room. Uh, uh, two years later, there were 2,000 people in the room. Um, and so, uh, the, given the fact that I had a bit of investment banking background, I had an entrepreneurial background, I thought it was, uh, you know, sort of complementary to sort of, you know, take the two skill sets together and then, you know, really work with aspiring entrepreneurs growth capital companies and really support them and, and, and invest in them. Mm -hmm. um, I thought I would do it for a couple of years. I ended up doing it for almost eight and a half years. Wow. Yeah. While I have you here, and I know that some of my followers are very business savvy, and for those who aren't, what an opportunity it is for them to hear from you. In private equity, it's basically investing in companies to know whether it's, it's worth putting your money behind them or not. What attributes or elements do you look at when assessing whether a company is worthy of you investing in? So. Great question. Um, when when you're looking at an investment opportunity, you're kind of looking for a couple of key characteristics. You're looking for businesses that have you know a clearly defined business model with a clearly defined audience. Ideally, one that's defensive, that isn't overly cyclical. You know, if the economy is doing really well, the company is going to do really well. If the economy starts to turn, you know, you lose your customer base. So you're looking for that. Um, you're looking for a, a, a sizable market or a business that's growing into a, a potentially sizable market um, because that creates runway, that creates potential, you know, sort of a sizable um, growth uh, opportunity and a good valuation. And then really it comes down to management and the management skill set and the management's uh, willingness to adapt and evolve and to um, continue to, you know, learn and take on additional responsibilities and, and, and work in a very collaborative manner with your new investment partners. Mm -hmm. These are the sort of things that we're, we're kind of, you know, usually in private equity you're looking for. So it's not all about the numbers, is it? Uh, eventually, you will get to the numbers and the numbers will drive, you know, potential, the, the initial investment valuation, its future potential, what type of exit mm -hmm. um, valuation could one achieve and so on and so forth. But initially, really what you're looking for at is the business. You're looking at the business, you're looking at the overall industry, and you're looking at the management team. That is the first step forward in, um, in, in a conversation. Mm -hmm. And then really you start assessing the financials. So let me ask you this, what's, what's a red flag for you? What's something that when you see it, you're like, I'm out? You're looking at um, businesses, for example, that are quite cyclical, you know, so if uh, the economy turns, they'll be amongst the first to, you know, sort of lose customer base. Um, you're looking at uh, businesses that uh, in industries that are undergoing tremendous either technological or regulatory change. Those are some, you know, major red flags. Then you're also looking at sort of the management team. You know, are, are they skilled? Uh, what uh, are they willing? Because uh, are they willing to bring on board complementary, um, you know, team members to complement their skill set? Um, can you do a deal with them? Are they going to be easy to work with? Do you have a common vision? Um, are you are they willing after three, four years to consummate um, an exit or liquidation um, opportunity? Or no, is this a business that they want to pass on to, you know, generations down the line? The elephant in the room. I want to talk about Nye. Sure. How did the idea come? Um, and um, I mean, it was so good that it made you turn your back on your very long career in finance. Was that a difficult, I'm asking so many questions here. Was it a difficult decision to leave banking? Whose idea? Where did the name come from? Sure. <laughs> Sorry, I'm um, like, pop, no, pop, pop. No, absolutely. <laughs> um, it was a tough decision. It was a tough decision and it took me a while before I plunged in sort of, uh, you know, f full force. Um, I w I've always been very passionate about sort of food. 
Um, I had some experience, as you know, with Al Furun. And I was always, you know, what, whenever I would travel, I would come back with suitcases full of products that were natural, that were better for you, that were healthier. And I started asking myself, why isn't there a brand in the Arab world, in the Middle East, that sort of um, had emerged to fill that space? Uh, the movement towards natural, healthier, organic is is not a it's not a, it's not a niche thing anymore. It's a tidal wave that is coming and it is growing year on year. Um, you know that industry is worth hundreds of billions of dollars ar- around the world, and people as they become uh, more informed, um, they are um, they're looking for things that are better for their health. We have some of the highest obesity rates in the world. We have some of the highest sort of lifestyle diseases in the world. And so this um, idea of health and wellness is, 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 is here, is coming. So while I was in private equity, I was constantly not just you know carrying suitcases full of food back to the region, but I was always reading up about these brands that were emerging all over the world. You know, brands that created products that were good for you, products that tasted good, and they were good brands, good brands in that they cared about the environment, they cared about their community. And, and I kind of felt, you know, um, where, you know, I had, I had um, the opportunity, I felt if I really sort of, you know, rolled up my sleeves, where we could create sort of a national or a regional Arabian brand that played to those themes. And so really what we did is we hired consultants, um, we commissioned them to look at the overall, you know, F&B snacking industry, we looked at 13 different product categories, and it was all when all was said and done, we we decided to you know really launch Nai or in the iced tea category. Why? It was the fastest growing category in the beverage industry at the time. It was dominated by one major player, and we really really felt that we could differentiate ourselves against them um, in terms of you know being a natural product, being healthier, uh, no sugar added. Um, in terms of our flavor profiles that were quite unique and the fact that we were a local brand that really we wanted to, as I mentioned, you know, inspire good and inspire good for Arabia. And really that was the mission. That's been the mission since the very beginning. And that's what we work towards every single day. So you're saying there is no iced tea brand in the MENA region? Um, There are a number of international multi-billion dollar brands that are active and that sell in the region. But we are the first mainstream, natural, healthier, Arabian uh, iced tea brand. From the indigenous population. Absolutely. And we are such a big, we are huge on tea. We're almost as big as the English. So tea is a staple of our diet. Uh, You know, we are massive tea drinkers. Um, And what was interesting is at the time when we were first launching, a lot of people in the industry were saying, hey, there's no market for iced tea. Iced tea, we're not an iced tea drinking culture, which didn't make sense to me, given the climate, given the fact that we're tea consumers, mm-hmm. given the fact that uh, you know we, could, we, we felt like we could innovate. Um, and I just sort of felt that uh, you know, it was worth our while to, to jump in and really you know, try our best. I like that. You challenged it. Mm-hmm. You know, it didn't make sense to you. Because hot tea isn't far off cold tea. I mean, there's a palate, even if you capture 10% of the hot tea drinking market, who's everyone. Absolutely. Um, uh, and so, so I, I could see now, you know, why you turned your back on the banking industry <laughs> to, to enter this. Um, did you expect to be where you are today, four years in? Listen, we, uh, what I'll say is we, uh, we, we had a vision, we had a dream. Um, we felt we had a good uh, differentiated product. Um, and it was really, it came down to execution. Um, I, I'll tell you, we, we face a number of hurdles. There wasn't a single manufacturer or bottler in the region, and we talked to about 15 who was willing to work with us when we first started. There wasn't a single distributor who thought, you know, sort of this would succeed. So we, when we first launched, um, we had to go start producing all the way on the other side of the world in California. And we were importing product from California. Uh, first containers arrived, and you know, I'd left banking, I'd left my suit and tie. Every morning I would go buy ice from the local baqala and would run around and literally almost beg people, please try our product, please okay. give us a chance. Well, I'll tell you what happened was, it was really humbling, but alhamdulillah, I remember sort of the day where um, probably within two, three weeks of us launching and us sort of you know, running door to door, um, we realized 
um, people are approaching us now. Wow. Uh, we're getting random phone calls from cafes and restaurants and supermarkets, some major supermarkets. Hey, we want your product. And our, our, our problem became, how do we keep up with demand? Um, great problem. So Alhamdulillah, um, you know, it was, a, it was a really exciting, humbling, tough uh, uh, initial phase. But, um, you know, I look back on that, that, that time frame. I mean, I, I just want to, you know, myself and I have two partners. So Fuad, Dajani and Azza, my sister, they were based in Dubai. They were doing exactly the same thing in Dubai, knocking, uh, on, doors. knocking on doors. And uh, I was doing the same thing here. And, you know, we look back at that period extremely fondly. <laughs> Did it look as pretty as it does uh, in day one or did you guys enhance it or change the packaging or the label? So there's a saying that I really sort of believe in. You don't know what you don't know. Um, and um, so the initial run of four, conta four containers is a lot of iced tea, okay? It's a lot of iced tea. We labeled with a transparent sticker, okay? okay. Now, we came to, to learn and find out uh, that... Um, natural brewed authentic tea which is what our product is um, isn't the prettiest color in the world and because we use single source tea leaves they it will have sediment inside mm. and so um, when you look at you looked at our product in the bottle fully transparent um, it looked a little bit it wasn't the prettiest thing in the world. Yellowy. It, it tasted good, but it wasn't the prettiest thing in the world. And so do you understand what it means to literally remove uh, the labels of four containers and then oh relabel with God. full shrink sleeve labels? Wow. So these are some of the like the learnings. You yeah. know? These yeah. are some of the, the learnings uh, when, you know, I haven't said that story in, <laughs> in probably like three, four years. But, you know, thinking back, um, um, you know, that, that we had to do that. Yeah, that was you took me right into my next question. You know, what were the learnings and challenges from early days? That's a that's a crazy story. Um, I'll tell you a funny story that naming Nye, okay, naming the brand, mm -hmm. naming the brand. Um, we, by the time we named the brand, uh, we had worked with three different agencies. Uh, we had spent a lot of money. It took almost nine months to complete. We had tried unsuccessfully twice to register brands, only to find out that other uh, brands had similar names and we couldn't register them. Mm -hmm. And what's funny, what's really, really funny is that when all was said and done, um, uh, we walked into an agency. The agency put down uh, two options on, on a big sort of whiteboard, uh, one of which was Nye. And my partners immediately said, that's a name, really like it. You know, English, Arabic, it's catchy, it's musical, it's representative of the region, et cetera, et cetera. And I, my, my jaw just dropped. Why? Because my daughter's name is Naya, and we nickname her Nye. So after all this work, all this effort, and it, we essentially named the brand after my daughter. Everybody thinks we named it after Naya from the get-go, but the truth was we literally you know, ran around in circles for nine months before we got there. You came full circle eventually. Yeah, absolutely. That's a really cool story. Um, you guys are very active online. I have... Uh, forensically went through your Instagram and on the website. It's really cool. It's different. Like I like how you guys touch on corporate social responsibility, etc. With the digital agent, like, you know, how people are so social media savvy, especially in our region. Did you guys capitalize on that? And was it something like you focused on in the beginning, guys, let's focus on social media because of the region? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so first of all, you know, shout out to Aza. She does a great job on, uh, she's our director of, of marketing and branding. Um, but we knew going in, so we can, before we launched the brand, we conducted a study of maybe around 15 global sort of natural food brands that had emerged. And it was, um, and we studied them. And we studied what they were doing from a marketing and branding perspective. And really the key takeaway was you need to get social media right. And so, um, and you need to get it right for multiple reasons. You know, it's, it's everybody's, you know, that's, that's the new age technology, you know, technology or, or, or medium. Um, but also from a budgeting perspective, uh, you, you get, you are able to achieve um, the best returns on investment from that perspective vis-a-vis -a, -vis a lot of, you know, uh, traditional 
uh, historical media, especially as an emerging brand, because of the fact that you can focus on, you know, sort of, um, uh, uh, you can focus on uh, speaking to an audience in the kingdom, mm -hmm. and then you can speak to an audience in Egypt. It's very, very focused as opposed to, and we're not large enough to be on NBC and um, and you know doing you know commercials on on a program. Yeah. Hopefully now in the next year or two we might start doing that. That makes more sense. But not when you're first yeah. uh, starting off. What industries uh, you know looking forward in the next ten years uh, do you think uh, will come to prominence? Um, and what industries do you think will slowly fade away in the next ten to fifteen years? So in terms of prominence, you know I think there's a lot to be done. Um, in the consumer goods space, um, where you, brands, new brands are going to emerge, brands that are more that play to health and wellness, brands that play to the idea of local, uh, brands that play to the idea of new experiences. I think consumers are starting to become a little bit, you know, tired and wary of multi-billion-dollar brands and that are homogenous regardless of where you are in the world, and they're looking for, you know, some of these attributes that I that I just mentioned. Um, I also think that uh, there's tremendous opportunity for uh, revolution or evolution in both the healthcare industry um, and also in education. Um, and then uh, I just feel that sort of travel is going to become really, um, especially, you know, post-COVID, uh, the idea of, you know, adventure, travel, uh, uh, um, you know, health um, experiences. Um, I think that's a segment and a sector that's going to that's going to do extremely well. Um, in terms of what industries one you know might be concerned about, one would worry about. I think retail, um, you know, the shift to e-commerce, the shift to sort of online is happening. COVID has only accelerated that tremendously, and I think really a lot of retailers really have to um, think hard about you know sort of their business model. I think a lot of retailers are going to be are going to need to transform into the business of experiences, mm -hmm. of providing consumers with, um, you know, this idea of a community, of a of a of a differentiated experiences to help drive them into the stores. Mm -hmm. So retail is a huge one. Um, um, just thinking about us as a business and what how our lives have changed. I also worry about telecom. I'll give you an example. You know, before COVID. I used to be embarrassed if I'd tell somebody, hey, listen, do you mind if we you know, have a Zoom chat or we get on a video conference or so on and so forth? So everything used to, long distance was always on by mobile. Today, it's, you know, we don't spend any money on long distance or our, our telecom bills have gone down like 95%. I'm not saying 50%, I'm saying 95%. We don't spend money on telecom. And it's no longer, it's the expected mode of communication now. Yeah. Whether you're speaking to somebody in the US, in Egypt, in Oman, wherever it might be. So telecom is one. I'd also think about travel, mm -hmm. business travel. Um, you know, yeah, our budgets have been absolutely slashed. I, for every, I used to travel two, three times a week. Uh, I was just speaking to our distributors in the US uh, our potential, inshallah, our new distributors in the U.S., and we both said something interesting. We said at this stage, historically pre-COVID, at this stage of negotiation, I would be flying over to you to meet you. And his response was, "And I would be expecting you to fly over to meet me." And we've gotten it done, literally f through Zoom calls. You didn't even meet face to face. We've huh? never met face to face. It shows you how needless business travel has. Honestly. <laughs> has been awesome. I could see that changing you know the, the hotel the hotel space business hotels I wouldn't want to be in that space personally a lot of businesses are gonna to have to pivot a lot of a lot of a lot of industries are gonna have to pivot and innovate yeah maybe not so much resorts but, that, but that's the difference in that you know I think travel is gonna be far more geared towards um, um, you know tourism yeah. around enjoyment around experiences mm -hmm. And around sort of you know uh, health wellness around adventure, mm -hmm. um, those are those are you know key segments that you know I believe there's there's good growth in, mm -hmm. as opposed to travel purely for business purposes. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of talk about electric vehicles, the EV space. Um, you know, our, our, our country has been a firm believer in that. They got behind and they totally bought out Lucid. And Lucid, uh, they launched their first product, I think, in Q1, if I'm not mistaken, Q4 or Q1. And they are 
the number one company to take on Tesla, which is dominating the market, the most valuable company in, in the automotive sector. Tesla is as valuable as all the other companies combined in the automotive sector. It's crazy. Do you see the change happening quickly as quickly as Kodak exited their photo space and everyone shifted to digital pictures? Or do you think it'll be over time? Like how quick do you think it'll be? So when you look at what's going on in the world in terms of regulatory change, in terms of all the noise um, with regards to the environment, um, uh, I think sort of this is, again, this is one of these tidal waves that is coming and there's no return. Um, and uh, I think there will be a snowballing and catalyst effect as the ecosystem around uh, enabling electric vehicles, so power stations, um, um, you know, just ease of use, uh, 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 familiarity with the technology. I think sort of that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a, a trend that is coming and is going to remain. Hisham, not only the electric vehicle space, but do you know that there are tractors that are electric? Do you know that there are buses being tested in Los Angeles today by a company called Ideonomics. When they stop to pick up passengers at a bus stop, there's a charger under it that charges it for the odd 60 seconds that it's there. And then it drives another mile and then it charges it the next one. Those buses are currently active in like uh, beta stage or whatever, but it's not just the electric vehicle. In the agriculture industry, tractors, in the buses, in the transport, trains. So four or five years, it could be a lot different to what it looks like to me. Absolutely, absolutely. And then you talk about sort of like driverless cars. Driverless cars. And um, you know, how, how transformative that's gonna be um, to the world, mm -hmm. um, because you know, it, it, can you imagine sort of de you know dependability on the roads allows you to do do anything. Yeah, uh, people will be on their bicycles. People will be um, you know walking uh, because uh, there'll be just a comfort of knowing yeah. cleaner yeah. air as yeah. well. People will get everywhere faster, faster because you won't need you'll need fewer traffic lights. Yeah. Um, you'll you know you'll need fewer roundabouts. Speaking of getting, you just actually remind me of something. Speaking of getting people faster to where they need to go, the line, that's pretty interesting. You go down a couple of floors down and you can take the small train or the, the slow train if you're going within your neighborhood, or you take the bullet train if you need to go to one end. I mean, conceptually, it's, it's interesting. That's really exciting. I mean, it's really exciting. And I'll tell you, uh, you know, I was just traveling abroad for first time in a while, um, people are intrigued uh, globally. People are really, really intrigued. Uh, they're seeing the commercials and, um, you know, it's raising a lot of awareness and interest in the kingdom. Yeah, yeah. It, it really like almost threw out the blueprints of how you would normally put together a city. And let's try it this way. Uh, Isham, you've been back to Saudi for two decades exactly. It's 2021. You moved back in 01. Is there something that you know now that you're like, man, if only I knew that back in 2001 when we were kicking off Al Foran, for example, that those days? Very, very uh, a, a funny story. Uh, I left JP Morgan in on April 30th, 2001. I was in Jeddah May 1st, 2001, and I was meant to start my MBA on sept in September 2001. I genuinely thought that I could set up a bakery business in three or four months. And then what you quickly realize is that really life and business and the world is not a sprint, it's a marathon. Um, um, and that's something that I, I constantly try and remind myself of. It's a marathon. You need to you know, plug away day in, day out. Um, some days, are, you know, some parts are more painful than others. Um, and that you, you know, you really need to also, as part of that marathon, to sustain yourself, to be able to compete year after year, you need to take care of yourself. So, you know, as I've grown older, I kind of look at things like exercise. I look at things like sleep as an investment, as opposed to something that, hey, um, you know, I'm lazy or, you know, I'm taking time off of work. I look at it as an investment. I look at it as me sort of nurturing myself, taking care of myself. So I can run tomorrow, I can run next year, and I can run the year after that. I think that's been a really, really important lesson because I was truly naive when I first came back. I've never heard anyone put it that way, and it really spoke to me just now, that you look at sleep as an investment. Interesting. Yeah. I am, I am going to use that and quote you on it. Yeah, absolutely. I'll tell you something. Um, 
you know, I, I, I genuinely believe like, hey, if you're, you can perform more capably uh, by taking a, a 10 minute, 15 minute power nap, uh, that those 10, 15 minutes will allow you to work more efficiently, more capably for five hours afterwards then, you know, it's just, you know, I look at it as an investment. Um, sometimes if I'm tired, I will go for a run. Those, those, that half an hour, those 45 minutes will allow me to come back mm -hmm. and to work for another three or four hours. Mm -hmm. Is that what you do for fun? You you run tennis. I, I lead. I, I've you know sort of. I lead a very Spartan life. I um, um, you know I can tell you pretty much where I'm going to be at any you know sort of uh, any day at, at that time of the day. I, I you know it's a pretty fixed schedule. Um, but yeah, I, I mean I work. Um, I exercise every day. I, I literally make it part of my my life and my day. Whether I get up at four in the morning or I do it at nine p.m. at night. Um, I try and allow myself to, to rest and to sleep. Um, I like to read. So I've started this new habit where before I go to bed, um, I will walk and I will be reading a book while walking. And it sort of l relaxes me. It around the house? Me, around the house. Um, in the house, actually. Um, and I do, I'll do it in a hotel room. Um, mm -hmm. But it sort of relaxes me. Um, I get a bit of additional exercise yeah. uh, just before I go to bed while I'm reading. Um, and then, you know, I spend time with the family. Fantastic. Um, Are you plugging in crazy hours? Uh, like, what's the life of a C CEO of a beverage company? Like, how many hours are you in the office for? We, uh, I mean, you, you try and maintain a balance, um, and there are always ebbs and flows. So, you know, some some weeks, some months, you're working 80 hours a week. Um, I'll say most weeks you're working probably somewhere in the range of 50 to 60 hours. Okay. Yeah. Which is your nine to six, nine to five. Yeah, it's 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 reasonable. What we we what I will say is, um, you know, you have different times of the day where you're doing different types of work. So, you know, during the morning, it's very you know, operationally driven. You're dealing with, you know, just, you know, issues with customers, with supply chain, with. Um, and then I'll say usually the sort of like early evening, that's when you kind of have time to have sort of more strategic conference mm -hmm. calls. You reach out to sort of markets in other parts of the world. And then I will usually work for an hour at, uh, before I go to bed as well. Mm -hmm. um, and that's really where um, I've exercised. I'm, I'm more relaxed. It's quieter. Nobody's calling you, and that's when thinking happens. Yeah, yeah. Good um, ideas, yeah. New, new flavors. Yeah. <laughs> what advice do you have to you know those out there who haven't found their calling in life, and you know they're trying to find out their purpose? How could I, you know, be the best version of myself, or you know, something along those lines? I would I would sort of think about what you enjoy, uh, what you're passionate about. Um, if uh, if you still haven't found it, try new experiences, try new new you know new new roles, um, because it's really really important for you to be sort of passionate about what you do. That that you know it, it makes it makes it easier to get up in the morning. It makes it easier to sort of fight the hard fight when things get tough. Um, so it's really important for you to know sort of what you really enjoy, um, not to be pigeonholed in something that you know you really don't see a future in or a career in. Um, I think that's really really important. Um, what I'd also say is, I, I, you know, there's nothing that, you know, I've ever done. There's nothing that, you know, sort of I've ever read uh, uh, or seen in, 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 in sort of somebody who's enjoyed success other than really hard work. Um, you know, it's very, very rare to find people who are so intellectually sort of brilliant that, you know, it's life is easy for, you know, it's really rolling up your sleeve and it's hard work. It's hard work yeah. day in, day out over a long period of time. And, um, and then, you know, once in a while, it's very few of these moments, but once in a while you can really take a, you know, you take a step out of your, you know, your, and you look at, hey, look how, how far we've come. Look at what we've done. Alhamdulillah. Yeah. Yeah. Recognizing you know. uh, progress mm -hmm. and tapping yourself on the back. Well, Hisham, uh, I really enjoyed this episode a lot. Very informative, very inspiring, um, you know, to those who not only want to get into the, you know, beverage business or any kind of business. I mean, in four years, you can do a lot and those four years came 
uh, at a time when the world stood still for six months, uh, if not more for some industries. Um, that's why I say it's inspiring. Mashallah, you guys uh, put your head down, weathered the storm, and now you're entering new markets like the US, like Canada recently, South Korea. I think I heard Mexico. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I just, I, I applaud, and I, and, I, and I bet a lot of people watching are, are applauding, and I hope people find inspiration from all the, the wealth of knowledge that you shared with us. Thank you so much. Really, uh, Mohammed, uh, really, really appreciate. I, I congratulate you on uh, really the success of, of this podcast. Where you've come in in one year is incredible. So, uh, you know, we're going to be um, avidly supporting and watching you on your entrepreneurial journey as well. You. Uh, you've inspired a lot of us. And uh, really, thanks again for inviting Appreciate me on. It. Couldn't have chosen a better person to close uh, my inaugural season. Uh, a person who, I, I mean, he is, uh, I don't want to say how old you are, but you know, you're my older brother's age and I, and I l look up to both of you and, uh, and I get a lot of inspiration from you as well. I've heard you on another podcast on the radio recently. And whenever I track you down, you know, if we're at some event and I have a short conversation with you, I just, you know, I try to pick your brain as much as possible because I could leave with something that might help me in, in my travels. Um, but I, uh, again, man, thanks for sharing, you know, two hours of your evening to come in here today and, uh, and close the first season. My honor. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Have I really enjoyed show. this. Yeah. Thanks a lot again. Man. Thanks a lot. Cheers, buddy. Cheers. Cheers.